one of people's best skills, a skill that very rarely gets uh, that people re very rarely get credit for, people very rarely get credit for this skill, is that of focus, of paying attention to the exclusion of other things. Uh, it's not considered a thing to try to get better at, <laughs> especially in the United States. Being focused on anything means that you're not ready to receive commercials or buy stuff <laughs> or if the you know the world wants you to be focused on everything you can buy more than anything else and that's not being focused on a single thing uh i used to get in trouble when i was a child for paying so much attention to a book or a television show or a, an object i was holding that I wouldn't hear when my name was called. And to me, that focus, it's the kind of thing you hear about surgeons having when they're doing a good job, or musicians having when they're playing well, or any performer having when they're, they're really making it work. That is a thing to be sought, and a thing to go get. And I think being able to drill down and focus on one kind of art and change your focus slightly for another kind of art, almost as though you're looking through different colored lenses, depending on which uh, practice you're practicing. That is the thing that art and science have in common, and that is the best thing that you can do with your time as a person. So I think getting carried away by whatever you're focused on is a great idea. You should do it whenever you can. Even if that means that what you're focused on is uh, the Wizard of Oz because you smoked too much weed today. Fine. I'll start there. Fine with starting there. Uh, but let yourself care about what you care about and go where it takes you. The only thing that makes people happy, seemingly, is when they do that. So, it's the road to having a nicer life. You should do that. Let's see what else we have. Mm -hmm. Words stuck in your throat. Well, that's a very common experience. I find people don't mind if you pause when you're thinking. There are many words that people use as thinking words. Uh, like that sort of thing. When you perform on stage, you learn to try to pull those words back, hold them back as much as possible, and just be quiet because it makes things less confusing for a listener. But those words have their own power. And I think in recent years, people have thought about those connection words I think sometimes people don't get taken seriously when they use those connection words. And people have started to realize that style of speech and the content of speech is different. And maybe someone is younger and they use a lot of connection words because that's how they talk, because that's how they've grown up talking. They're fine to have. Get all the words stuck in your throat that you want. Also, uh, Maybe the best thing I ever learned about making sounds with your voice is that you could make them backwards. You could make them by pulling air in rather than pushing air out. And it was like getting a whole second voice. And I don't know if it's something that I'm great at, but it's something I like doing a lot. So figuring out how to... I used to try to teach myself to sing a song backwards and upside down by upside down meaning that you would sing it all by breathing in and then backwards in time uh i thought that was more fun <laughs> i don't know what was wrong with me when i was a child but i played video games backwards if i could those were all the ones that i liked the ones you could play in reverse i think i was just a pretentious child i think that's all that means but 
Uh, having words stuck in your throat just means that maybe they should be going in instead of coming out. That's not really a bad thing. Many people fear uh, speaking to a crowd, but I don't see having words stuck in your throat as a problem. So I don't think that's the issue. I, I think people also fear that somehow there will be a social punishment if they do badly. But the truth is, whatever it is that you imagine being the worst thing that would happen if you performed and it went badly. You took a dump, you, you know, uh, took off all your clothes and ran around like a chicken, whatever. Whatever it is you think is the worst thing that could happen. First off, you probably won't do it. But second, even if you did, whatever the punishment would be, you are already receiving that punishment, both from yourself and just in your life, people are terrible to each other. They've already been terrible to you. You've already had all the punishment. Go ahead. Commit the crime. Be an idiot. Everyone looks dumb. No one minds. So uh, having words stuck in your throat, it's some people's... There's there's a, a psychological stance, that or mood rather, that matches stuttering. People think of it as the sound of anxiety and the sound of being afraid in front of others and I think you can let yourself have that sound and not be scared of it that's all okay those are words stuck in your throat chatter and the, the rustle of language so I spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to go back and forth between voice sounds that have sense that have meaning and voice sounds that don't and trying to just go back and forth over the line again and again and again it's impossible to balance on that line you can't be between it's really really difficult when words start to devolve into things that don't mean anything into sound into sheer sounds uh most of the time when you hear it recorded it's a single person's sound, but most of the time when you hear vocal sounds that don't mean anything in regular life, it's because it's a multitude of people. Uh, I think it would be fascinating. I think one of the only ways that you could balance on that fence as much as possible would be with an orchestra of voices some of which were making sense and some of which weren't. So that there would be, it's a better balance to have multiple things that make sense coming at your brain than it is to just have the occasional thing. Your brain knows what to do with that. And I think that's just because humans are built, the way heads are built is that they're pattern makers. So any pattern that can be made will be there. <laughs> Your brain is really good at finding patterns and one of the biggest binaries that is difficult to get around, it's difficult to have both at once, is the whether it makes sense or whether, whether it doesn't. Like there's no, there's art that is representational, there's avant-garde art, there's no avant-avant, there's no meta-avant. I mean you can have conceptual art, sure, but there's no like third section after that you can't it's just not how people's heads are uh when i was younger if when i was 16 17 18 maybe i think i would have found that disappointing because i wanted to have my own frontiers to break that no one had ever broken that's a typical 16 year old thought but I think we're very lucky <laughs> that it only goes a couple of directions. Um, now that I'm in my 40s, I realize uh, being able to figure out the limits of things and have a scope set up for you helps you get rolling. So I don't mind that. Um, some people are annoyed by background sounds like chatter. I usually just like them. I usually just enjoy them. I find that similarly 
the binary of whether it means something or whether it doesn't, whether you want to pay attention to it as a framed piece of art or whether you want to ignore it is something you can turn on and off in your head. And once you learn to turn it on whenever you want, you can enjoy whatever's happening. Much it's That's a very John Cage idea, but it's helpful. It makes your life nicer to be able to, uh, for instance, where I work, where everyone eats lunch, everyone has to eat lunch by themselves in this very small room. And you are within earshot of everyone else, but you're sequestered in a very small room with very little space. And in the room, right above your head, in the only chair that you can eat lunch in, is uh, an electri electric box, an electricity box, which hums constantly. It's about, I think it's about 85 hertz. And it's pretty loud. It's not the sound of an amplifier that is on with nothing go th going through it, so it's not that cliche, but it's a common buzz that you hear a lot from electrical equipment. And all of the employees hate it. They'll do anything to eat lunch anywhere else. And I love it. When no one can see me, I'll rest my head on the box. <laughs> because you can just enjoy this pure frequency buzzing through your head. And that's I think that's a very fine thing. So to me, the idea of chatter is a lot about the foreground versus background. And that's something you have control over it. And once you take control of it and figure out how to use it to make stuff, um, it becomes much easier to see regular annoying things in your life as things you can reframe. So chatter's pretty good. It's not bad for you. Theory of humor. So a theory of humor is... A total theory of humor is impossible because... Jokes are meant to be surprising. We all understand that. We all understand that it's a surprise. Any single box or definition that you would put, even a very modal, open-ended definition, anytime you define what a joke is, instantly, by just the way jokes are, the best joke that you could tell immediately becomes a joke that doesn't fit that definition. So it's very hard to talk about jokes. Some people like the definition of benign violation, which is workable. There are various, excuse me, there's a, there are various ways to attack it. You know, there are sort of modes and perspectives that are useful, and some of them become useful. Some of them suit people better than others. You know, some people are very suited to one way of attacking humor. Other people are very suited to a different way. Sometimes you'll get into situations that are very suited for a particular way of thinking about it. But I think most people who are interested in humor, interested in doing it and making it, they are ready to go in various directions at once. You kind of have to be. The, all of the ones that I know, let's see what the ones that, if I can remember them off the top of my head, the ones that I know. Uh, a simple one is extension. Uh, what's a good example of that? I don't know if I'm going to give you very funny examples, but I'll give you examples that will make it make sense. Extension would be, uh, or hyperbole is another good way to talk about it. Um, that would be, instead of saying, boy, I had a lot of pizza last night, you would say, I had as much pizza as they have on the sun. You know, you would exaggerate greatly. Everyone knows you didn't actually eat the sun. Uh, what else? Uh, one of the biggest ones is metaphors, or um, some people call those T-charts. Most jokes have two elements, or two paradigms, or two topics, two scopes. Um, I think one of the, a useful way to think about jokes or anytime you're talking theory of knowledge type stuff, 
uh, I find light is a useful metaphor. So the way uh, you make a joke by putting up um, a red lens and a blue lens, and then the joke is purple. Does that make sense? So, uh, yeah, last night, last night I heard uh, local comedian Brian Sullivan tell the joke, my grandmother has Alzheimer's. Some people think that's bad, but I think it's okay. It's just like getting a grandma remix. Like, grandma, every time you see grandma, it's a new album by DJ Thinks Your Mom Is Her Mom. Uh, that's very simple. That's very simple. Two, it's well told. It's a nicely structured joke. It's two things. Albums and grandmas. <laughs> you know, two, just two things. And, uh, all he did was fit the things that go with one of the, one of the sections into one of the other ones. So he just took DJ, featuring DJ so-and-so and stuffed in things that happen when you have Alzheimer's. Um... And that's a very easy way to write a joke. Uh, there are a million jokes like that. They're fun to write and getting, they work well. They're, they're great. Some of the most beautiful jokes I know of have that structure. Um, uh, some people, uh, sometimes I just call them metaphors when they, when I mean those T-chart jokes, but that's a bit of a misnomer because it's also a metaphor to say, uh, there's a local guy, Nick Ortolani, who has a joke that, and he's talking about hipsters and how, uh, he was robbed by a hipster, and when the robber left, he says he rode away on his corduroy unicycle. And it's a great line. It's very vivid. It's very funny. All he's doing is overstating the case. Um, but sometimes when you overstate the case, you almost make a metaphor. So whatever. It's sloppy. I'm being sloppy. Let's see. What other things are there? Um, one whole chunk of jokes is taking things literally. Mike Kaplan is really good at those types of jokes. Just taking things that aren't meant to be, that are clearly meant in one way, as literally as possible, get, get you lots of jokes. Uh, let me think. Do I have any others? Let me go, hang on, I'm going to look. What else have I forgotten? Oh, uh, reversals are a simple one. Uh, in Russia, all the jokes tell you. Um, where is... Oh, I'll give you an example of a, a literal joke. Here's one that I tell. Um, when I was a child, I had this really pretty babysitter, and she tried to teach me what gaydar was. Do you know that word? Gaydar is a slang term for when you can tell that someone is gay. So she tried to teach me what it was, and what she said was, I always know when I'm talking to a boy and I reach out to touch him on the shoulder or I lean in to engage him, if he backs up, I know. And I heard her say that, and I thought to myself, holy cow, everyone I know is gay. Just that's an example of taking things literally. Um, what are some other ones? <laughs> Louis C.K. has a famous joke that is a very good example of logical extension. Uh, he was tweeting on being on a plane with Sarah Palin. And I'll probably get the words wrong. You can look up what they exactly are. But basically, he said, yeah, Sarah Palin's great. She just has a Chinese family living in her vagina, um, meaning that she is a giant cunt. <laughs> and uh, that's a great logical extension. Um, what else? Uh, there's also puns, just simple. I'm George Washington done with your attitude, that sort of thing. Goofy puns where you just say, a couple things at once at the there's a television show called at midnight that a lot of comedians like because they do a lot of wordplay jokes uh, and then there's one of the categories of jokes is just being silly <laughs> uh, 
that's hard to articulate. Uh, that's when you really start to get away from being able to define what's happening with humor. Just bringing up just absurdities, just bringing up Airbud out of nowhere. Uh, just, you know, when someone falls down. All of those things are just silly, absurd things that make people laugh. And they're fun, and they don't have to have any big thing beyond that. Uh, do I have any other ones? Uh, lots of jokes come off of... Uh, I have a whole category that in my head I call Lester's Dictionary. Which is... I got that from a Sun City Girls song, that name of that category. Uh, Lester's Dictionary is when you define... It's an old thing. It's something everyone does. It's so when you define things more truthfully or less truthfully in order to tell a different sort of truth. Let me give you an example of that. Um, like a beatnik dictionary or a, people will write whenever they want to make fun of something. Like if a men's rights activist wants to make fun of feminism, he'll write a feminism glossary and tell you things that my friend Gloria has a bit about that. Um... Uh, anytime you have a a cliche, a phrase that people say all the time, you can turn that into a joke by just either, again, taking it literally or taking it to its logical conclusion because they never completely make sense. Um, there's a million of them, but uh, that's where all those I like my women like I like my coffee jokes come from, things like that. Um, and then there's just lying for effect when you lie on purpose and everyone knows just sarcasm, that sort of thing. That's something people don't count sometimes, but it's very useful for getting, uh, an audience to be with you. Uh, and kind of calling the room, calling out what you look like, just stating what everybody is thinking is a weird way of making people laugh that works if you do a good job. Like, sometimes people try and do it and they do a terrible job. Uh, because, like, I could call attention to the fact that these magazines are on the table, but no one cares that those magazines are on the table, so nobody's upset about it. So there's no tension. I'm not breaking attention. Uh, one of the reasons... One of the things that jokes often do is they resolve a tension that people felt but hadn't articulated to themselves. Or... They set up a tension and then break it. Um, there's plenty of stuff to be done there. Uh, some people think that in the 80s, there's a famous joke book that said that every joke needed to have a little act out after it. Like every time you told a joke, you had to do a little goofy gesture to make it make more sense. And that's what all the punchlines were. Uh, you still see, see people tell jokes like that. It's not that it's not wrong, um, but it would be weird to do all of them that way. <laughs> and it seems really strange. But yeah, uh, acting something out is sometimes a way to get people to laugh at it. Um, a lot of times when people are new to comedy, they will just say things and they don't realize that all they've done is say a premise. They haven't said the punchline yet and sometimes you can get the punchline out of them by just asking them why why that why that thing uh telling an audience why you care about a certain thing can sometimes make it makes it makes sense suddenly why it's funny because you've got one context and then you let them know what the other one is um yeah, those aren't all the jokes, all the kinds of jokes that there are. And that was a very sloppy way of talking about all of them. But those are most of the ones that I know. Uh, that, and that's sort of like writing level. Um, in a theory of humor, any theory of humor would also have to have a sort of like, why would anyone do this level? And I think having... To me, when you do comedy, it's like starting a band with everyone in the room. Not everybody knows they're going to be in the band at the beginning. But if you do a good job, by the end of it, everyone is together. It's very community building. It very much, It's very inclusive. 
and a good comedian gets everyone thinking the same thoughts at the same moment. When a really good comedian is going, you can hear an audience breathe together. Like, it's amazing. It gets all of these people, like, thinking at the same way at the same time. It's very inclusive, and it's very, like, sounds stupid, but it's like uh, um, an emotional hug or something. So, I think comedy is great for that. It's, it's one of the biggest human coping mechanisms. No one, no one, never met anyone anywhere who was actually having a nice day. It doesn't exist. Everybody's life is shit. It's just a pile, a river of shit. It is rough out there. And they, people need it. <laughs> um, so I think it's good for that. It helps people be more open, which is the only way that they ever change their minds. And it's the only way that they ever get happier or learn or grow or anything. Like, um, you know, it's fear is really the thing that shuts everybody down. So laughter is a way of, of just banishing that. And, uh, Anytime you think that the world is going bad, and it is always going pretty bad, uh, comedy is something that actively makes that go away. It actively changes the world for the better. It literally, it, it, you know, it, it can be very political in a very, uh, like, the philosophic sense of political, because it, you know, it literally takes roomfuls of people who are having a hard time, because the people who go to comedy clubs are, you know, like, drunk People who work in offices, maybe. You know, it's like drunk machinists. <laughs> you know, it's not like people who show up for local comedy are not like... It's not because they have a lot of other shit to do. <laughs> so, it's, it's a really great thing to watch a room come together while somebody's talking. And just turn a nothing into a really good time. It's a weird awkward, but amazing thing to watch people do. So I think, I do think anybody can do comedy. Uh, it is more about taking away the barriers between yourself and an audience than it is about putting skills on. Um, everyone makes themselves laugh. Everyone makes their friends laugh. Um, there are people who are very talented at it, certainly, but it's something everyone can try and everyone can do and actually grow at and get better at. <clears throat> so, uh, it's a really interesting art from that point of view. Um, I often think of it as it's music for deaf people. <laughs> it really is. It's instant music for deaf people. Um, and that's nice. That's It's nice that everybody gets to have that. Uh, do I have anything more dumb things to say about the theory of humor? I talked way too much about this topic, but I'm interested in it, so. Yeah, I think I got most of them. Um, a lot of comedians don't like the same way whenever you bring up music criticism, there will be some dingbat who is like, Frank, it's, all, it's always a different person. Frank Zappa says, or my mom says, or whoever, says that writing about music is like talking about dancing. At the same way, there's a whole slew of people who do comedy who think that talking about it abstractly is a terrible time and is ruinous for everyone. And I think it's fine that they think that. <laughs> um, not everybody is built like I'm built. Uh, and I think what people bring to an art, whether it's comedy or music or whatever, you bring what you're good at to it. In order to do it well, your job is not to find some magical ideal out in the stars and go grab it. Your job is to find what is the most you and figure that out and present it to people. You know, your job is to dive in and be as clear as you can and be as you as you can. So 
I like talking about abstract stuff. I was a philosophy major. I like to pick things apart uh, and compare ideas and stuff like that. That's just me. So I find that's, that stuff very helpful. I like comedy classes. I like goofy humor theory books. I like, I like all that kind of stuff. Uh, I love music criticism, all that kind of junk. Um, and other people, it's not the way they work. It's not how they figure things out. For them, it's like learning to dance by drawing a picture. It doesn't make any sense. Why would that help you? It's something for me. <laughs> I've gotten a lot of useful ideas. Like, I, I often get ideas for sets from talking about how I think comedy works to people. Or, like, uh, yesterday, someone posed a question to a message board about what topics you think are hard for you to talk about on stage and why. And both watching other people's reaction to that and thinking about the topics that I liked and that were easy for me and were hard for me, it gave me a whole new idea of something to talk about. It gave me a whole like chunk of things that I wanted to try and I started and I'll see where I get with it and maybe nowhere but that's the whole project in the first place so you you try and just get to be more and more yourself as you go along with with both music and comedy and I don't know if you ever get to know, a lot of people who do comedy and who do music ask themselves often, or ask each other often, whether they've found their voice in the sense of their personality within the art. And I don't know if you ever get to know what yours is. I think you get to keep working at it and maybe over time you realize, oh, I tend to like the things over in the blue box. You know, I tend to like the things over in this box. I realized that the more, I, you know, it took me many years of paying attention to music and being like, well, I don't like that. And then eventually I started to be like, well, I don't like that and I know why. And a little more time went by and I was like, well, I don't like that because of X, Y, Z, said one, two, three, four. And eventually, understanding all of the things that I didn't like pushed me in a direction. <laughs> um, so, little by little, I started to know, like, oh, that's the direction I, I do like. <laughs> um, and But comedy is something that I've only done for a few years, so... I know some things that I don't like, and I sometimes know why, but it will take a long time before that pushes me in very far in a direction. Um, and I may never know what the name of the direction is. I still, you know, like, I, I kind of know what the name of the direction is for music. So when people ask me, what kind of music do you play? I tell them, oh, it's experimental jazz. And if they know a lot about music... I'll be like, oh, it's improvised jazz, and I concentrate a lot on sound poetry and extended vocals. But most people don't even know what that is. <laughs> so I uh, just tell them, like, oh, it's gargly noises. <laughs> and that is, they understand that. Uh, with comedy, it's much newer, so I, I have to wait to find out. I know what kinds of things work for me because I present in a very particular way. Um, so I know kind of things that I can get away with on stage and things that I can't and so on and so forth. But, but I don't know if there's ever a point where you're like, oh, that's the voice that I have. I don't know if that ever happens. Maybe it does. I don't know. Um, when you see... Uh, very famous comedians on television or very famous musicians on television or whatever, read about them or whatever. It often happens that their voice happens to match up with an iconic archetype 
that everyone needs a version of. You know, Bruce Springsteen is always going to be your buddy from high school who <laughs> wears denim and just drinks beer. <laughs> and, like, everyone knows a guy like that. You know, everyone is familiar with that. That's an archetype we all understand. Even if we have no buddies from high school <laughs> or no one wears denim <laughs> or whatever, uh, everybody kind of knows what that means. Uh, and he just fits his, whatever his voice is, just fits that. Uh, let's see if I can think of another <laughs> another example of that. Uh, Amy Schumer, I, she just put out a special, so I was thinking about her earlier earlier today. Amy Schumer, the reason that she is currently well known as a comedian is that she fits like a goes out every night blonde girl archetype. Um, and that's what she uses in her act constantly. She plays on those assumptions all the time. Uh, even if she's telling a joke, whether she's telling a joke about feminist topics of some sort, like her latest specialist, or whether she's telling a joke about, you know, a dude with a sexy name. It doesn't matter. She could be telling a joke about cookies. It doesn't matter. She always is working on those archetypes because that's what her personality does. That's like where she fits. Um, so 99% of all of the musicians in the world and all the comedians in the world will not ever be that. Uh, like 99 is generous. It's like almost everyone. You have to know that ahead of time. You're not likely, and there's no controlling that. You can't force yourself to be a person like, if you did any art trying to be this person that you thought fit an archetype that was going to make you money, that is bankrupt immediately. You'll never get anywhere. You're just going to be a dick. You're going to be a horrific human being. So, you can't do that. It makes no sense. Uh, sometimes people are assholes and uh, other people who are less... Uh, successful look at them and they're like that's what that person did maybe they did maybe they didn't I don't know but you can't <laughs> to the extent that you're aware of that stuff you can't do it yourself you have to do things in a way that's holistic you have to do it from the inside out you have to figure out what is you and then if it happens to work with people great and if it doesn't well whatever you know like you can't make up how people are Chances are good that you are also a person, so some of what you figure out about yourself is some of what other people figure out about themselves. So it's not like you're going to be talking to, you know, you're not going to be talking, you're not doing comedy for a room full of cats. You're not doing comedy for a room full of goldfish. It's other people. You will have something in common with them. Um... But... You know, that's not the same. That's really different from the, like, be on the cover of the magazine or be on TV or whatever. So, some people get really tripped up over that part of it. And that part of it is very easy for me because I play experimental music. I never expected anyone to like what I did. So I'm already very familiar with the fact that nobody will like it and it doesn't matter. And one of the ways that plays out, uh, you would think that having been a musician for 20 years before I started doing comedy, you would think that I would immediately start making noises during comedy on stage. But that is not what happened. <laughs> and most, the other, I know of a few other people who spent much of their life involved in, in experimental music and around the same time I did got involved in comedy. And it didn't happen to them either. Uh, what happened was that we understood why you would do it at a, like a not making a living at it level really easily. And you understand why maybe being on TV is not the only goal. <laughs> maybe that's not the only point. Um, and I think within comedy there's a big alt versus club divide and some people will tell you that that is real and some people will tell you that it isn't and blah 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 
it's kind of a East Coast, West Coast jazz argument. It doesn't really, it's a non-argument. Um, but that, there is a understanding why it's happening like that uh, right when you start gives you some advantages. And one of the big advantages of it is that when you start to do small shows, you're often, uh, through no fault of anybody, on shows where no one comes. <laughs> you know, where like the audience is supposed to be 30 or 40 people and it turns out to be three. Uh, or the audience is supposed to be, you know, 75 people and it turns out to be 15. That's really normal for people who are not making a living at comedy. It's really normal for people who are making a living at comedy. It's just a thing that happens all the time. And a lot of comedians freak out um, because they think of comedy as something that happens with an audience which it does. It's, uh, it doesn't happen. You can't do it to a mirror. Uh, you can't do it in your house. You know, it takes the feedback of somebody else. So when they realize that that feedback might not be there, they have no idea what to do. Uh, but people who have played experimental music, they always know what to do. <laughs> They've dealt with those audiences all the time. So they understand that like one of the tricks of that is if you turn up, if you get to a room and the room is too big, you have to figure out how to make the room smaller. You have to shrink the room to fit what is there. And if you go to the effort of doing that, people respond to it and they will, you know, so I'll do really goofy, like, let's pretend we're at camp and you... You know, you literally throw a blanket over yourself in the audience and then start talking to them. Or you you scoot up next to them and you change the way the room is. Like, you you make everybody aware that they're together and it helps. So it is... It, some people think that language refines the way that you think. I don't know if I completely agree. People do a lot of inarticulate thinking. <laughs> it's not that I think that, uh, like people are a little too stupid for that is, is what I mean to say. Um, people have a lot of thoughts that they have no words for and they have a lot of just like inarticulate grunting things that go on in their brains uh, that aren't words. So and there's a fair amount of comedy. You'd be surprised how much of it isn't words. Uh, Boston is a very writerly town as comedy goes. And it's a very abstract town as far as music goes. Uh, it is a town of intellectuals, as much as you can say that in the U.S. anyway. Um, it is the closest city in the U.S. to a European city, I think. Uh, it's not, but <laughs> but it is, you know, nobody gets upset that you're a professor here. <laughs> Nobody's going to beat you up on the street because you said something with more than two syllables in it. Uh, and that's reflected in the ta the musical taste and the comedy community, uh, in the musical community, like how people talk to each other, how people give feedback about art that gets done, how... Uh, there are often, in both musical and the comedy communities, there are often, like, workshop environments where people just kind of bat around the extraneous ideas to try and figure out how to think about things better. Uh, it's just what works well here. And I appreciate that. That's one of the reasons I live here. I like the way the comedy community is here. I think it suits me. And it also works on the things that I like working on, and it's super writery. It's more about language here than it is in most places. Um, it, once you s learn how to do delivery a little bit with either comedy or music, it's amazing what garbage you can get across <laughs> and, and what garbage you see gotten across successfully just because people understand how to do that. Uh, timing is really something and 
It's very ephemeral. When you hear, when people talk about timing, usually like when I hear people say the word timing, I think of like Bob Hope <laughs> and that, you know, Bob Hope's timing is a pile of shit. That's just, that doesn't exist. So, um, but when you hear delivery, it's, it, it's pretty impressive to like, you can hear, there's some people who can just turn it on and off. There are a lot of performers who play experimental music as well who understand how delivery works and what it is and what it can do for you. When I think of what I do to play music, I basically think of doing music and doing comedy as almost the same thing, except that with comedy, the thing that you turn on and try and infect into the room, like a, a light switch, is fun. And with music or with jazz, <laughs> the thing that you kind of like vibe into the room and try and like turn on is just creepy. <laughs> and I'm very naturally creepy, so that one was always very easy for me. I'm less, oh. I'm less naturally fun, truthfully. Um, but fun is still an interesting thing to try. And occasionally, when I get interested in figuring out how to blend those two arts, I try being creepy during comedy. And people have no idea what's happening, but they are interested. <laughs> if they ever invent a creepity, I will be its star immediately, and it will be a great time for me. Uh, but I think it's, f it's fun to try and figure that out. And that's really what delivery and timing are. It's this weird kind of like controlling the room with your vibe, which sounds stupid, but... To me, that's an easier way of thinking about it. And when you try it, it's amazing how well it works. <laughs> uh, I think most people can do it, actually. It's just one of those, like... It's basically just pre like when you pretended things when you are a kid. Uh, and you pretend for with people, like with other people, and they help you. It's pretty simple. Uh, and so much of that isn't linguistic. Much of the physicality of comedy and how you present and what people assume about you is not linguistic. Um, but all of it is a backdrop for language. And then language is like the rocket that takes off from that. It's all like a launching pad for what language can do. And... Most of the things that most of the things that people remember from a co a comedian, or the reasons why they like one comedian over another, have to do with that. Um, usually, when people like a musician or a comedian, it has nothing to do with how well good they are. It has everything to do with whether or not they see the person and they go, "Oh, I'm like that." It's almost always what it is. Almost always. Um, and when people are, just the same way, when people are famous, it's like a whole chunk of people are like, oh, I'm like that. So that's something you have no control over. Uh, and it it isn't a one-for-one one thing. Like, I'm a really big fan of the comedian Mike Lawrence because he seems gross. <laughs> And that's a simple way of putting what is great about him. You know, he has amazingly written jokes. He's a great crafter of jokes. He won the roast battle uh, the first year that it happened. He's fantastic. He's really talented. But the reason why I like him is because he seems gross. <laughs> and, and that's completely out of everyone's control. Um, so... Voice and language are something that both are all of what you have to work with. They're everything that you have to control. They're everything that you can do anything about. And yet they almost don't matter. <laughs> uh, and that is strange. That's a strange situation to be in. But uh, that is the situation you're in. So, I mean, I think probably even painting is the same way. Like... The reason people like Eddie Munch versus Vinnie Van Gogh is like 
because they're like, oh, I'm, I'm like that guy. Uh, and that has nothing to do with painting. <laughs> so really your job is to push personality through whatever the art form is. And the reason the language is so important is because it's like the screen that you're pushing everything through. Uh, so set yourself up for success and use language, use your voice to get it through more, better, to get it through more clearly, to like push whatever it is about your personality, whatever it is that you want to get out to people as clearly and simply and quickly as possible. Like language is really, I call it a rocket. <clears throat> it is. It's like your arrow to people's brains. So being able to control it and use it and play with it is the gift that you have. That's what you get in return for all the dumb shit that you have to deal with as a performer. Um, and getting to change people's minds with just things you say, you know, getting people to, to watching a room change for the better because of some dumb thing you thought up is great. Okay, and roasting is, uh, roast battling is when two comics write insults about each other, and they go back and forth telling the insults, and an audience decides who did a better job. And it is a, it is often a stacked competition so you knock people out little by little, and then you have a winner, an overall winner. Um, roasting began... Well, roasting, insulting people is as old as time. Uh, in the mid-60s, there were television specials called Celebrity Roasts, where some entertainer would have a dinner that was broadcast on live television with an audience, but everybody ate. I don't know why. And they would invite a bunch of other entertainers, and everyone would sit in this big, long table facing the audience. And then one by one, everyone would get up and speak about the guest of honor and insult them. And uh, so it was, a tr it was a weird tradition that happened... Sometimes there's no rhyme or reason to who got it happened to and who it didn't, but they were usually relatively well known people. In the early 2000s, it began happening again as kind of a somebody like intentionally rebooted it on TV, and it started, it got popular enough that now there are shows in several cities in the country where that's what people do. Uh, so it's a weird genre of comedy uh, that is very uh, that is just about insulting people. Uh, it's a very tight form. Only it's like uh, what musical genre is it like? <sighs> That's really hard. Um, you know how people will say about punk rock, it only has three chords. In the same way, uh, roast jokes have a very specific form, and they're super tight, super short, and the trick is you insult the crap out of whoever you're talking about. Um, so that that's just the existence of that genre as a very defined genre is a weird development to me, a really interesting development in comedy. Um... There have always been styles, people who do one-liners, people who are very story-based, um, people who are insult comics, which is pretty close to roasting. Uh, but most comedians mix them up. A decent comedian that you would, like, someone who is not famous, you would see in a club, a Mohegan Sun or someplace like that, would do a bunch of different things. They wouldn't veer heavily into one style. Sometimes 
national level comedians veer mostly in one style, but even someone like Mike Birbiglia is well known for doing a very story based comedy and his most of his specials instead of being specials they're almost one man shows which is another almost genre what is the difference between a one man show and a special there isn't a difference really you get to talk longer in a one man show that's really about it uh it's a little less jokey joke and a little more of a loose story about the person's life that's it that's almost no difference so but he's well known for doing a storytelling style. But even he has a variety of kinds of jokes buried into those stories. He has things that are one-liners that are just inside of the story. You know, he has zingers that are insults about people that are just inside of the story. So, style in comedy is usually not hard line defined the way style in music is. You know, I'm sure, and many people who follow music heavily, they can tell you in five seconds of hearing a piece of music when, where, uh, the name of the genre, and where it fits in the history. Uh, I think because music is mostly... A lot of the information, is, sonic information, is not words. So there's, the style is all, there's a huge history to the style. And so you know the second something comes on, who made it, when, what their goals are, blah, 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 blah. And comedy is like that to a degree, but not as much. Like there are... There's, you can't play, like... Old comedy kind of doesn't exist. It's not that it's not there, and it's not that you can't appreciate it, actually. But uh, comedy is so tied, because, it, because of making people laugh, it's so tied to surprise that you can only get so far away from what people are like in their time. So, like, if I... If I memorized a 1960s record by Bob Newhart and then went and did it at a show, it would not work. Even if I was very good at it. It would also not work because I would not be good at it. <laughs> but <laughs> it would not work even if somebody who was very good at that sort of thing did it. Um, and that's a weird thing about comedy. It has no history. It has no shelf life. It doesn't... When things change, it changes everything about the art. Um, and that's an unusual thing. That's hard to kind of... It's a, It's really different. That That's the thing that's super different from music. Um, music, you always have this huge... Uh, sense of when you're doing things and in against what background you're doing things and comedy the background is always just now it's there are such things as jokes that are like timeless or jokes that are I don't know, that have a date to them or something like that. It's hard to articulate, but it's uh, basically because it's about surprise, there's no second time. You can't, that's why you can, you actually can tell a joke twice, but the second time you tell it, the reason people are laughing is different. Um, there's real Borges problem with comedy that doesn't exist as much as it does with music or that doesn't exist as much in music um so the joke that you're telling you can repeat the same joke twice but the second time 
You're making people laugh for a completely different reason, and they know it. You can even tell it a third time. Um, but your laughs will diminish because the second and the third are the same joke. <laughs> Does that make sense? Um, the third time you really, like, the first time you're telling it, you're telling the content. And the second time you're telling it, you're telling, the joke that you're telling is, I am doing something I already did even though I'm not supposed to. And the third time you tell it, you're like, I'm doubling down on the fact that I'm doing something that I'm not supposed to. And those are three slightly different things that you're doing. And audiences understand that. They're not stupid. They get what you're up to. But, like, you're not actually telling the same joke at that point. You're just using the same words and roughly the same delivery. But the fact that it happened before makes a huge difference in what's happening. That is very different from playing the second chorus. Does that make sense? When you when you have your punk rock song, the second time you come around to the first chord, it's still just the first chord. <laughs> you haven't changed anything yet. <laughs> the second time around you come around to that second chorus, it's just the chorus. <laughs> um, it doesn't build the same way. They don't build the same way. So... It is like making music happen in that you're controlling how time works but and how people feel during a time as time goes by in front of their faces. Uh, and it is like experimental jazz and improv in that you're just like doing it with nothing, basically. You know, most improv is not... It's not the instrument. <laughs> it doesn't matter what instrument you have. Mo anybody who plays noise will tell you your stuff is 90% broken all the time. That's not what you're doing when you're playing. It is part of it, but that's just the venue for what you're doing. Um, mostly what you're doing is like giving people a space to f have this uh, particular sort of experience that you know how to get to. And comedy is, has that also. Um, but the specificness of the experience is much more restrained. Okay. Okay. Finally talked myself out.